Well, everyone, good afternoon, and welcome to Funders on the Front Lines. And I just want to start out, I'm curious, um, to find out how many in the room are affiliated with uh, foundation or philanthropy in any way. Okay, great. Uh, wonderful. Or, are, well, you may have included that in my last answer, but those of you who may be funded um, by foundations or philanthropy. Okay, great. Um, so we've got a really knowledgeable audience here. And I think one of the interesting things that's happening at the Ideas Festival this year is that we are having an engaged conversation around philanthropy. I think it was yesterday that there was a conversation called Dangerous Liaisons. I give them a lot of credit. That's a wonderful title. Um, that focuses on, focused on the issues of democracy and philanthropy and some of the challenges that may occur with philanthropy. And this afternoon, we're going to take a slightly different tack and focus on the ways that philanthropy is engaged on social justice issues, particularly today. And my name is Melody Barnes. I'm chair of the Aspen Forum for Community Solutions, um, and we are um, host for this particular panel. In a second, I'm going to turn this over to Steve Patrick, who will introduce the members of the panel. But I just wanted to start out with a few framing remarks. Um, as I said, we're having a conversation about the role of philanthropy, and I think all of you know that philanthropy has historically played an interesting role when it comes to social justice. And you think about the Ford Foundation and Rockefeller, as well as um, family foundations, regional um, community foundations and the role that they've played. And typically, they have tried to leverage government resources, whether they be literally uh, financial resources that come through the budget process and appropriations process, or to enhance government programs and to align themselves with those programs. I think in all cases, philanthropy has not tried to replace government. And we certainly don't want to send the signal here in our conversation today that we think that philanthropy should replace government. In fact, we are big advocates for cross-sector work that uh, requires all actors, including philanthropy, to work together to deal with big, complex, hairy, audacious challenges. But what we are finding at this particular moment in time, at a moment when the government has been more skeptical um, and I put that in quotation marks, skeptical, about how it is engaging on social justice issues. When we have a budget um, that's been proposed that has really radically gone after health care, um, nutrition programs, programs for youth and education, that philanthropy has stepped up in a very different way. In some cases, doubling down on programs that they've already been working on. In other cases, launching new programs. In some cases, focusing on advocacy, um, whether it's advocacy toward government um, or beyond, um, to try and uh, support these programs, encourage greater resources for these programs, and oftentimes in court and a litigation strategy. And all of that has, has happened around uh, the concerns that many have uh, regarding the kinds of cuts that I've mentioned and the implications um, those cuts will have on the ground, um, whether it be in rural America, um, the challenges that we see um, in urban America with regard to racial and ethnic and religious minorities, kind of the list goes on. And that's the conversation that we want to engage in today. Why and how philanthropy, whether they be it be donor advised funds or philanthropy that's embedded inside a business or independent foundations of all sizes have chosen to step up at this, at this particular moment their thinking, their strategy, how they're doing it, what they're doing, um, and how they're engaging with the community and going about it. And that includes our own work um, at the Aspen Forum. So that's the conversation that we're looking forward to having with you today. I'm going to turn this over to Steve Patrick, who will introduce the members of the panel. And that will also, uh, after they engage in conversation, tell you more about their work, provide you an opportunity to engage with them, ask questions, perhaps questions that are coming off of yesterday's conversation as well, but we welcome you to Funders on the Front Line. And I was told, literally, that I could drop the mic, um, <laughs> which I won't do because I'll probably get charged for it, um, but, you know, this is my mic drop, so. Just in case the mic breaks, our program code at the Aspen Institute is 106. No. Um, <clears throat> uh, thank you, Melody. Uh, thank you for your leadership of the Forum for Community Solutions, and and more broadly across the country. We, we thank you for your service in the White House. I know many of you uh, miss the times when you were head of domestic policy and 
Um, it's a real privilege to work with you. And thanks to all of you. It feels like uh, literally family and friends in the room, my sons and wife being in the back row to lead the heckling when that begins. Um, only when I'm talking. You got that, guys? You cannot heckle the panelists, just me. But it, it does, it is great to be amongst a, a bunch of friends and colleagues. And so we actually want this to be very much a conversation. We're going to be short and sweet, and then we're going to jump in about this concept of funders on the front lines. Let me just offer a couple of additional framing remarks about this. One is that, you know, our assumption at the Forum for Community Solutions at the Aspen Institute is that the current context is not normal. Some of you probably have seen the hashtag not normal. Um, and so we are coming at our work from that point of view. Obviously, the Aspen Institute is, is ruthlessly nonpartisan, bipartisan in our work. Um, so we're not coming at it from a partisan angle, but we've been working on issues of equity and opportunity and social and economic and racial justice in our program for the last five years. And so we are concerned. Um, and we hear that from our colleagues uh, on the ground. Um, and you'll hear a little more about our work on the ground uh, from uh, the amazing Monique Miles uh, on this panel. So that's some framing about this. I felt like it was a little bit like the old Eddie Murphy comedy routine when he's like, y'all who came for buckwheat need to just get out now because we don't want to do like <laughs> some kind of overly cleansed, you know, not real about the moment we're in kind of conversation. So we're, we're going to try to keep it real in here. And whatever happens in Aspen stays in Aspen. <laughs> Except for when Grassroots Aspen is filming this for the local cable network. <laughs> In which case, if we're going to go viral, well, let's just go viral. We'll, we'll, we'll see what happens. But I just wanted to frame it up that way so we can have a real conversation. Um, let me tell you about our amazing panelists. I'm just going to do the short version. Uh, Lotha Reddy from Prudential. Um, we go back 20 years, probably. So, and I've aged. 30 and you've aged 10, so that's not fair. But uh, Lutha leads all of the social responsibility work at Prudential. She chairs the foundation um, and does it. Uh, uh, we're going to hear a little bit about how Prudential thinks about the moment we're in, but also how they think about social change, equity, and opportunity in America and in Newark. Uh, Leticia Puguero, who is um, I think you can count the number of Latina CEOs in philanthropy on one hand. Luz Vega Marquis, uh, yeah, maybe a few fingers. <laughs> yeah, maybe half a hand. So uh, what, and no pressure to represent, you know, the most diverse group of folks in the history of the, the world. But Leticia um, is leading um, the Andrus Family Foundation. Uh, and some of you are probably from, familiar with CERDNA, but there's a little flip there, which we'll get into. Doing remarkable work uh, uh, on the ground on the front lines, and we'll ask you to talk some more about that, Leticia. And then Monique Miles, who is the director of the Opportunity Youth Incentive Fund here at the Aspen Institute. Uh, Monique is, of, of anybody at Aspen, probably most responsible for the ability for the Institute to actually give away millions and millions of dollars as a re-grantor. She helped design and create this Opportunity Youth Fund, which funds communities across the country, and you'll get to hear more about her work, and has a lifelong history of working with young people, uh, most recently at the National Youth Employment Coalition before coming to Aspen. So these are, are our esteemed panelists. Let's give it up for them as we jump into this. <clears throat> Lotha, let's start with you. Um, and you know, we, we kind of already messed up because we called this funders on the front lines because it just didn't sound sexy enough to call it companies and funders on the front lines or corporations. But, you know, Prudential's got a, a great history of investment. It's interesting, how many of you heard about Darren Walker's commitment at Ford for putting a billion dollars into socially responsible investing or social impact investing? Yeah, guess who announced that before Ford? Prudential actually has a fund and has committed a billion. Uh, no offense to Darren, I know he's gonna be here later, so. Uh, uh, but it's pretty cool to see a company making that kind of investment. And that's the point about this is beyond, when it comes to Lutha's work, it's beyond traditional philanthropy. So maybe talk about how you guys approach it, the work, and then we can get a little into is anything different given the current context? Great. Thank you, Steve. And good afternoon. It is great to be here. 
I'm going to go back in time a little bit just to give you some context for uh, how we think about it and, and how we think about this moment in time. So I'm sure you all know Prudential is a financial services firm. We were founded over 140 years ago in Newark, New Jersey, where we proudly remain headquartered. What you may not know is that we were actually founded to provide insurance for working families. And that was at a time uh, when these families did not have access to insurance products. And that was because the prevailing belief was that they couldn't afford to pay the premiums, or more insidious, uh, that they couldn't be trusted to pay the premiums. But our founder knew differently, uh, or knew otherwise, and so he created products that were both affordable and appropriate for the population at the time. And with that, Prudential was born. And so when we first began this work, right, our front line, so to speak, was the American worker in the workplace. As we grew as a company to be a global financial services firm, our commitment to addressing issues of inequity, of changing the narrative, right, so to speak, and uh, of creating business solutions to societal problems has remained core to who we are. Now, as Steve said, uh, we're at a moment in time that is not normal. Uh, and, you know, the business community is not immune to this. Uh, and we see it on lots of different fronts. And, you know, but what we know fundamentally is that it's not enough for us to think product by product or sort of issue by issue, right? We need to step back and think about how it is that we can leverage all of the capabilities that we have at our disposal to create shared value, right? Shared prosperity. How do we think about societal impact and societal issues and bottom line economic value for the firm and do that simultaneously? So our new front line are capital markets, right? How do we think about leveraging traditional capital markets to create a societal benefit and a financial benefit? So the way we think about it, and I think it's largely generalizable to other companies, but some of it will be specific to Prudential, uh, is it cuts across several different areas. So you know, one is, how do we think about maintaining that culture of purpose and in helping to ensure that our 50,000 associates around the world understand that they need to be uh, considering the societal implications of every decision that they make in addition to the financial implications? It's about how do we continue to reconceive products and services just as our founder did uh, and reimagine markets so that we are serving a vast uh, set of the population, right, broader than we may be serving now, and serving them in ways that, again, are appropriate and affordable and accessible. And so that's everything from uh, being the first American insurer to underwrite insurance policies for people living with HIV AIDS. Mm -hmm. It's the work we do in affordable housing, right? It's the work we're doing in emerging markets like Africa and several countries there where we're helping to expand access to financial services for the growing middle class. Another area is a focus on talent. How do we think about, right, given the changing demographics in this country and the issues we're seeing all over the world, I'm thinking about opportunity youth, right, and the large numbers, the millions of opportunity youth whose talents are being left on the sidelines. How do we think about engaging them in the real economy, right, and building these ecosystems that create talent pipelines of diverse people to come up to companies like Prudential or just go out in the world, right, and offer everything that they have. And so, one example is, uh, you know, we, <laughs> we're a company that relies on actuaries, and there are many other businesses that do, uh, but there's a dearth of actuaries in the world. And so we're building out actuarial sciences programs everywhere from El Paso, Texas, to the continent of Africa, and so that we can support homegrown talent, right, local talent that, again, can support these industries. We're also thinking about investing with purpose. Steve mentioned our billion-dollar commitment to impact investing. We've been doing impact investing for over 40 years. But what we're trying to do is broaden that aperture of the intentionality of investments, right? We're an asset owner. Every dollar that we deploy has an impact. It could be negative, it could be net neutral, it could be positive. But how do we think, again, broad, more broadly as a firm, about deploying that capital in ways that make sense for the world as well as for us? And so it's everything from our emerging manager program where we're investing in diverse asset managers so they can access capital, diverse VC uh, programs that we have so that venture capital can go uh, get into the hands of diverse communities and so on. And then lastly, and I'll end on this point, is, and this may be unique to Prudential, but as I mentioned, we were founded in and remain headquartered in Newark, New Jersey. This is a city that's suffered from decades of disinvestment. We have uh, really tried to change the conversation about anchor institutions and the role they can play, and the fact that you know, companies like us are an anchor institution, right? We have uh, real roots in the community and a commitment to the community, and we've proven that. And so how do we, in a very local way, in a place-based way, again, use our business platform to divert dollars to the local community through procurement, through right, incenting our employees to live in the community so that they can also invest on their own in Newark? And then how do we uh, train and hire local residents so that they, again, can be part of the real economy? And so those are some of the ways that businesses can think about moving the needle on equity uh, in specific ways that we're doing it. Just quick follow-up. <clears throat> Other companies, are, step, are they following your lead on the billion-dollar investment on social impact? We have not seen many uh, 
institutional investors who are doing that. But we're, there's a lot more private philanthropy getting into the impact investing game, which is great to see, leveraging their endowments for mission-related investing. Great. Thanks. Maybe, maybe we'll inspire others uh, as the video goes viral uh, uh, in the not-too-distant future. So, Leticia, let's talk about your work. Um, and I, I actually would love to also drill down on, on the moment. Um, but first, you, you're having a little bit of a coming out party right now. As, uh, how long have you been executive director now? Four and a half years. Four and a half years. Yeah. And how long has yeah. the fund, because, so folks may not know, there is the Cerdna Foundation, mm -hmm. um, which is pretty renowned for its work uh, uh, around community development and other things. And then mm -hmm. in the last few years, mm -hmm. the family said, we're, we're yeah. coming, it, it was a very quiet fund, mm -hmm. and you came on to kind of Disrupt that. Yeah, <laughs> be less quiet. So I'll shut up so you can be less quiet and tell us about um, sure. the, the fund and also how you think about investing. Yeah, sure. Um, so just a, a little background on that as well. So Cerdna, it's the Andrus family, and Cerdna is Andrus spelled backwards. A little um, philanthropy trivia, if you're ever playing <laughs> that. Um, and the original donor, um, actually Cerdna just celebrated their 100th year anniversary, so been around for a long time. And the original donor uh, made his wealth from actually the precursor to um, like Pepto-Bismol, if you, um, something called peptinoids, and really fun story if you wanna talk to me later about how that happened um, and what it is and what was in it that made people feel so much better. Um, so, um, so the Andrus Family Fund was actually created to give um, the next generation of the Andrus family uh, an opportunity to engage in philanthropy and organize philanthropy and civic participation. So that was the original intent of the fund. Um, it's a really big family that right now there are about almost 500 people all over the world. There are eight branches of the family. So the idea was how do we create a fund that will um, give people the opportunity to engage in organized philanthropy and then, frankly, to also keep the legacy of the family philanthropic practice. So I think it's important to say that. Over the past um, some odd years, the fund actually has been around for about 20. Um, I came on about four and a half years ago. We've started to think a little bit about um, a few things that I think are important to the family as a whole. So one is the issue of equity, social justice, um, and racial, racial equity in particular. And I'll talk a little bit about how that sort of shows up in our work. Um, and then two, really thinking about how, what is the role of family philanthropy in sort of the overall philanthropic industry, right? So um, I was doing a little research this morning and looked at the National Council of Family Philanthropy that says that most family philanthropic institutions are actually quite young and give away about less than $10 million. So oftentimes we hear, um, you know, the really big guys in the game, like the Gates Foundation, right, give away lots of money, but most family philanthropic institutions give away about under 10 million um, and have been created since 1970. And I'm excited to know that that's young because that means I can call, you know, being born a few years after that, I can still call myself young. Um, <laughs> but in the past sort of four years, one of the things that we've done is think a little bit about how do we situate family philanthropy in a place and time, right? And so Melody spoke a little bit about the history of um, philanthropy, and um, we, from our perspective, always think, well, right, the phil philanthropy can be really helpful in communities, but also can be really disruptive in a way that, I don't mean like the innovation technology disruptive, but disruptive in that we sort of step into communities um, and then leave, right, without community voice and impact, right? So for us, the past few years has been how do we situate ourselves in this moment in time um, and understand the historical legacy of philanthropy in communities and how do we engage community in what will happen, right? How do we enter, how do we think about it, and whose voice um, and whose expertise matters? So that, I think, frames a little bit of how we think about the work. We focus, um, we're a small funder, we do between four and five million dollars a year, um, and that's how I know that I've totally made, um, my friends think I've been co-opted because I start to say that five million dollars is small, um, <laughs> and that maybe I've lost my organizing roots. Um, but, you know, it's all about context, right? And philanthropy, it's a fairly small amount of money. Um, but one of the things that I think for us is really important 
It's um, how do we lead unapologetically with data, right? And so the data points us to race, and that means that we have to lead unapologetically with race. So if we're talking about, if we're looking at what are the indicators of disconnection in the United States and for the population that we care about, and we care about vulnerable young people, and I'll say what that means in a second, then we have to lead with race because race is the key indicator when we look across the board that will help us understand what is someone's chances of being connected to poverty, being connected to the criminal justice system, being connected to the foster care system, of, being, of having access to wealth, not just income, but wealth, right, family wealth. And so for us at the Andrews Family Fund, that means that we have to be unapologetic about how we lead and how we fund um, programs. It also means that we are going to very clearly talk about vulnerability. Um, and so some of the work, Steve and Monique, that we all do together is how do we think about vulnerability and who are we talking about? So for us, we're oftentimes talking about young people that are invisible um, to the rest of the world. Um, by choice sometimes, but oftentimes by, by structure um, and by history. So we're talking about young people that are justice involved. Um, we're talking about young people that are foster care involved. And what we uh, say at the Andrews Family Fund, um, again, that we're disruptive, I'm not talking about innovation disrupt disruption, but disruptive systems. So for young men of color, for example, the education system can be disruptive to their well-being. And so for us, it really is about how do we enter um, those spaces with respect to the cultural competence of communities. Um, and so just really quickly, I'll end with, with this. I think for family foundations, there are two places, two ways to think about impact. One is how do we do our grant making, right? So all of what I've been talking about is how do we think about our grant making? How do we enter um, whose voices matter? And then I would say that the second place of impact is how do we think about family legacy and wealth? Um, which I think is really important. And so when we situate um, family foundations in place and time, and we understand the historical legacy of philanthropy in communities of color, in historically uh, marginalized communities, this idea of how does a family foundation really think about its legacy, its wealth, social justice, and equity, then makes us ask ourselves different questions, right, about who's on the board, um, who's on staff, um, when do we listen, in our case, to young people, what informs our practice, um, who gets the grants, how do um, organizations that are run by and for people of color or LGBTQI serving organizations, how do they get to the front of the proposal process, um, what parts of the country we fund in. So I think um, for us, and some of the uh, work that we do with the National Council of Family Philanthropy, it's really helping families think about not just the grant-making aspect of the work, but also thinking about how do you think about family, wealth, and legacy. Um, the last, last, last thing I'll say is that for us, this idea of situating grant-making in a time and in a place requires you to think about the context that we're living in. And so direct services for us, is, it's not enough, right? It's important work, but it's not enough. And so we have to ask ourselves, are we trying to um, disrupt, in a positive way, um, structures and systems that lead to inequity? And if we are trying to do that, it then means that our funding has to happen within a context of understanding the current political uh, infrastructure. And so for us, what it's meant is that we fund policy and advocacy work um, around juvenile justice reform in particular. We fund direct service work because we need to take care of the here and now. And then we fund community organizing work, in part because we think it's an amazing time to fund community organizing. In part, I'm a little biased because I come from that world. Um, but also because we believe that that's, that's our truth serum. The organizers keep us real, they keep our ears to the ground, and they let us know when, um, when we're not being truthful. Um, so. Fantastic. Uh, how many other funders in the room actually fund community organizing, just to get a little sense of who's in the room? Great. And I love 
that you kind of touched on the kind of equity in philanthropy question. Uh, I think for the purposes of this conversation, for equity, we can use the policy link definition of fair and just inclusion in, in society. And, you know, I, I think about, um, I worked a long time in New Mexico, Alvin Warren's in the back from the Kellogg Foundation, uh, you know, just philanthropy for native issues, half of 1% of all philanthropy. So how do we look through that lens about our own giving in a way that creates more equity? Um, just one quick question, mm -hmm. then we'll go to Monique. Anything different post the election for you guys? Like, yeah. did, did something happen? Did, were there, I'm sure, internal conversations with your board? Sure. Yeah. <clears throat> so, you know, our board, um, they were distraught and um, for the most part, not, not everyone. Um, but I think they, they wanted to know what was the best um, response. Like, do we turn all of our dollars into rapid response dollars for organizers that are on, organizers are on the ground um, um, that, that whose bodies are on the line? Um, uh, or do we do something else? And um, so we, we are not created in a way to be able to give money out really quickly, you know, like the sort of some organizations can do like three days after the request comes in. We're just not created that way. So we've partnered with some folks to do some rapid response dollars. Mm -hmm. um, but I think for us, we felt really good about our work mm -hmm. and the fact that we are funding in this way that, uh, that really brings young people front and center, that really allows us to have their voice. And what we heard from them was just keep doing what you're doing. Um, and from the folks that are working with them. So keep funding the organizing, keep funding juvenile justice reform, even though the context may have changed. And so we're, we're sticking it out for the long haul. I said I was gonna to go to Monique, but just bring one of those organizations or individuals into the room for us. Sure. Who would be an example of a, of a grantee that you said keep doing what you're doing in the context? Sure, so there's a great group based out of DC that um, is called Youth First. I would encourage everyone to look them up. Um, and they're a national campaign to close youth prisons. Mm -hmm. um, and so they're national, they're based in DC, but they work at the state level because uh, if you know, juvenile justice happens at the state level. Um, and um, they work to, with a group of organizers on the ground uh, to, to really think about which states are ready to close youth prisons. And so some of them are unusual suspects like Kansas, um, Virginia, um, Connecticut, and so we talk to them, not just to the adults who run their um, shop, but we also talk to the young people and told them, you know, this is the current uh, political climate that we're in, help us understand how we move forward. And they said, uh, they helped us understand how we move forward, which was how do we continue to underwrite this work? How do we continue to put young people's voices front and center? And then how do we um, supplement some of the funding that we've been doing with them? That's a little bit different to help them build capacity. So there's some capacities, right, that organizations that are doing this work need that they don't often get. And so that's a little bit different, but we, you know, they're a great example. That's helpful. Mm -hmm. Talk to Leticia mm -hmm. afterwards if you want to help support that mm -hmm. work. Speaking of closing juvenile prisons, uh, mm -hmm. Monique, it's a good segue to you and your work leading the Opportunity Youth Incentive Fund here at Aspen, uh, which has always been through that equity lens. So uh, recognizing that when you do that population level analytics that Leticia was talking about, uh, that that's a, that's a place where uh, inequity is significant in the out of school, out of work, youth and young adults. Um, you've been working in the justice space for a long time, all the way back to when you were youngster, uh, going in, <laughs> going into uh, places where folks were incarcerated and, and working directly. So, tell us a little bit about the Opportunity Youth Fund, uh, how it's structured, how do we leverage all these national funders and individual donors, and what does it look like? Just sure. short, brief. Yeah, um, I just, I guess I would start by saying it's a real honor and privilege to sit on this panel, um, not just with the institutions and foundations that you both represent, but the what you're doing right now, and to your point about legacy, what it will mean for future generations. So our work at the Aspen Institute with the Opportunity Youth Incentive Fund, it supports 23 communities across the country that includes not only urban communities, but rural and tribal communities 
communities because for us that was also how we thought about this equity question and how we could ensure that our dollars would touch multiple children across different backgrounds and geographical contexts. So we support 23 communities across the country to bring together cross-system and cross-sector leaders to redesign education and workforce so that it works for our most marginalized young people across the country who we call opportunity youth. And we know right now nationally there are 5.5 million young people who are out of school and out of work. Across our 23 communities that we fund, we are able to touch through our system work 1.3 million of those young people. And so with the Opportunity Youth Incentive Fund, we've been able to bring together local philanthropy, regional philanthropy, and national philanthropy to build this fund and invest in these pathways that reconnect Opportunity Youth. Our, our, our work is without question fundamentally rooted in a commitment to equity and justice, social, racial, and economic justice. We say all the time that it is not the young people who are disconnected, it is the systems that are meant to support our young people that are disconnected. And exactly as Leticia said, when we start to disaggregate the data, there is such a high correlation correlation to race that's tied to these disparate outcomes and structural disparities that for us, we are very clear that this is fundamentally rooted in a justice and equity play of how we think about um, committing to long-term sustainable change. So with that broader frame in mind, the sort of three ways that we think about this, first and foremost is then how do we focus on system change? How do we really get at the structures that have historically created these disproportional opportunities? And how are our communities supported to bring together cross-system and cross-sector uh, leaders to be able to focus on an advocacy play that gets to better outcomes for our young people? That's number one. Number two for us is civic engagement. Our mantra, and it's actually the mantra of our young people, is nothing about us without us. So they are at the center of problem identification and solution design. Our local collaboratives, they sit at the table to design the pathway strategy, iterate the pathway strategy, engage and bring their friends into the fold as this work uh, continues and grows. And nationally for us, even when we were launching this work, it was critical that we had Opportunity Youth helping us to design this at the national level. And the third piece for us is really thinking about multi-generational anti-poverty work. To the point about being funders on the front lines, we recognize that we are focused on multi-generational poverty, right? And that can't possibly be solved in a grant-making timeline. So what does it mean to not only focus on the structures and systems that we know are really important to change over time and the metric impact that gets to better outcomes around education, around employment, um, around long-term pathways to success and economic opportunity. But for us, that also means financial empowerment and financial literacy as well so that young people are able to not only build assets over time but also as we think about multi-generational wealth the type of assets that they can hand down from one generation to another because we also know that that is how wealth is um, connected from one generation to the next so that's a really broad overview of how we think about our work with the opportunity youth incentive fund and the communities that we support our grantee partners and youth at the center of this work I wanted to also focus on the second part of your question which, is, which was what looks different right now in real time, right? Um, now to Steve's point earlier that this is not normal and so many of our community grantee partners felt like they were able to make such significant progress in terms of bringing together cross-system, cross-sector leaders over the past several years and really begin to see metric outcome, begin to see the type of administrative and legislative policy changes that are disrupting barriers to opportunity for young people. And so for us, for First and foremost, we are doubling down on our commitment to youth engagement. And it's actually exactly what Leticia was saying. We are specifically looking at how we support youth organizing. We're partnering with organizations across the country, like the National Council of Young Leaders and Opportunities Youth United, to ensure that in the communities that we fund, we are really tied to community action teams that are designed by young people, led by young people, and tied to a policy agenda that for them is really about how they create system change for the long term. But that is all youth led, youth organizing that really has its roots in the grassroots way that they get to better advocacy outcomes over time. So um, that's number one for us. The second part for us as we think about the sort of um, 
real-time response right now to what's happening is how we also support youth and adult partnerships that are also about building multi-generational leaders. So right now in this moment, how are we looking across the generations to partner to get to better outcomes? And what does that mean as we think about the sustainable way that young people have opportunities to continuously not only move up professionally and have an impact, but what does that mean in terms of community-based leadership? What does that mean when we think about the system and structural changes that are necessary. So part of our work also in this moment real time is supporting the multi-generational approach to how youth and adults come together to do the problem identification and solution design that's really responsive in this moment. And the third piece that's actually at the core of all of this is really our commitment to the justice population. So also as Leticia was saying, when we begin to disaggregate who opportunity youth are, we know that they are disproportionately tied and connected to the justice system disproportionately connected to the foster care system and so for us in in real time right now that means that we are increasing our commitment to really supporting outcomes that focus on free entry that focus on alternatives to incarceration that focus very specifically um, within this context on things like restorative justice for example so when we look at what our community partners are doing across the country being really intentional on how we double down and increase um, investments in better outcomes for justice involved and justice connected youth. So those are some of the ways that we're responding in real time. It's fantastic. Thank you, Monique. Um, it's interesting to hear it come up, uh, the sort of organizing and also racial equity as a key inflection point. Um, Brian Stevenson was here last year at Ideas Festival. And uh, I think he stole the show in, in many ways. And uh, not surprisingly, for those of you who've heard him speak. And you know, I, I just wanted to ask you guys to think about this. And then I actually want the audience to think about this. We, uh, Ken Zimmerman, you may have seen in the write-up, was supposed to be with us from the Soros Foundation, Open Society Foundation. He leads their, the US Soros work. And Ken had to take off back to New York moments after he got here because of a family emergency. So we wish him well and, and um, we appreciate that he was here. But this is something he probably would have picked, on, picked up on as well. So I'll put it out there to you all and then ask you as an audience to weigh in. And I may even call on, on people like Jocelyn in the back who's leading the Bar <laughs> Foundation and really focused on racial equity. And, um, but you know what Brian Stevenson said was, uh, that in this country we live in a bit of, we don't do shame well. How many of you think the US, are, the ethos of our culture that we do shame well? And yeah, we don't do shame well. And so he sort of was talking about truth and reconciliation in the context of South Africa that, you know, there was a country that had radical structural racism baked into the country. Structural racism has been baked into this country's systems as well. And, he was talking about it in the context of, of Germany. He said, when you go to Germany, the Germans want to share their shame. They want you to visit Auschwitz. They want you to understand um, the, the worst aspects of their history. And so Stevenson basically said, we actually live in a bit of a toxic haze. Yes, we are the greatest country uh, on the planet. Yes, we are always striving towards that ideal that is America. Um, but you know, how do you overcome that toxic haze if you don't uh, understand and address the history uh, instead of sort of sweeping it under the rug and saying, we win, all we do is win. Um, and so it's that, it's in the context of how do we collectively address, um, in, partic in particular, the, you know, the history of genocide uh, of native peoples and honor the Ute who um, lived here long before the billionaire tribe had discovered it. How do we honor um, the history of, of, of slavery, uh, of Jim Crow, uh, of what comes up in the, the amazing documentary 13 uh, that you can find on Netflix right now? And so I'll ask you guys, because many of you are on the front lines, um, uh, you are on the front lines of this question, and then I want to ask the audience to just kind of jump in with us and honor Ken by being our fourth panelist. Um, so how can we take what we're learning on the ground around the struggle, the ongoing struggle? Um, you think about the moment we're in, five, six, seven years ago, there was no movement for black lives. Nobody here had heard of Standing Rock before. Nobody knew what dreamers were. 
Uh, there is a big bunch of momentum out there. There's also a threat to that momentum. So it's a long-winded question. I, I, I'd, I'd love to just get your immediate reactions, and then I'd open it up to the audience to sort of say, okay, how does philanthropy get on the front lines of that, of addressing that toxic haze? <laughs> Easy question. Easy. Leticia, jump in. Um, so I think, so just two um, quick points. Um, <clears throat> Brian Stevenson, who in my f head is one of my best friends, <laughs> uh, we have very long, intimate conversations about the world. He doesn't know this in real life, but, um, but one of the things that he writes about and says is actually that, um, and so I'm going to butcher this, but he says that the um, United States' original sin, in his opinion, was not um, slavery. It was actually that there were... Um, that we created an infrastructure, like the movie 13 shows, to continuously um, recreate the conditions of slavery, right? Mm -hmm. so, so I, every time I hear him say that, um, you know, I get goosebumps because I think about, um, you know, without that understanding, um, we, we can't address the structural issues um, that continue to plague us. And so whether that be uh, issues of incarceration, um, issues of detention and immigration, right? Um, or, 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 you know, pick another one, wealth disparities. Um, without that understanding and that sort of clarity, um, it's really hard to diagnose the problem, mm. right? And so then we as funders step in um, and do potentially more harm than good because we're interested in a charitable approach versus um, really thinking about and asking the hard questions of is this going to really help um, communities that live or have lived at the margins? Mm -hmm. And so, you know, the, the medical sciences, right? They tell us if you misdiagnose a problem or a disease, mm -hmm. you potentially, you know, you can really harm someone. And so I think about the work that we're doing in that way, that Brian Stevenson's sort of laser focus on that issue um, of that the question isn't so much that this thing um, happened in the United States. It happened. We know it did. But it was that we've allowed it, right, over centuries to recreate the infrastructure that's needed so that it shifts from one kind of slavery mm -hmm. to the criminal justice system, mm -hmm. to over-policing communities. Mm -hmm. um, and so without really understanding that, um, I think funders, we, um, we potentially misdiagnose the mm. problem yeah. and the intervention. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I hear a lot of mm-hmm. <laughs> mm -hmm. Thank you, fellow panelists, for your mm-hmm. Uh, anybody else want to jump in on that question? And, and you actually, you're, you're probably sitting here thinking, well, I actually do. I am good. I went to law school. Didn't you go to law school or I, clerk? Or? I had the great pleasure of working for uh, Brian. Oh, I interned so for him when I was Damn. in law school. Oh. <laughs> and yet I still yes, wish that we were actually BFFs. But, um, and I only hope that I can do him, uh, do him service in my work. But just related to what your, Leticia was saying, right, that Brian's also talked about this notion of proximity mm -hmm. and being proximate mm -hmm. to people and to issues. Mm -hmm. And so that is something that we at Prudential strive to do, and especially given that we are in Newark, as I said. And so how do we get our executives and our employees out into the city, into the community, and interact with people so that they have a level of understanding that they wouldn't have otherwise as we think about how we re-engineer our work? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Monique, any quick thoughts? And then I'll ask any, if you want to say something about this, Jocelyn. Put a hand up. Your hand is up. Thank you. Uh, Alvin, so the mic runner and, and Monique, thank you. Well, I, I, I also um, hold him dearly <laughs> in, in my heart, um, exactly as you do. And, and I so not only agree completely with what all you all are saying, this, this question, too, about the haze and, and how we respond right now, I guess for me, the, um, the way that I tie you know, his identification of the problem and how we in partnership with a cross system, cross sector approach are able to continuously move forward structurally. I think about um, what Mayor Mitch Landrew did recently mm -hmm. in New Orleans and very specifically him being so clear that when we think about our founding fathers and we think particularly, well, when we think about the Civil War and Reconstruction and what these um, symbols really re represent, 
I, for me, I, I think about that that is also part of how we not only remove the haze, but how we partner really locally with leadership to ensure that we are able to really address the historical way that um, inequality continues to perpetuate and operate in ways that could, I think, really you know, be disruptive to our long-term goals. So for me, I think that's a big part of it. Okay, a couple of comments, and then we'll go to questions. Thank you all for that. It's helpful. And my comment or a question? Whatever you want. <laughs> you have full license, and you have the mic. Oh, hi, I'm Jocelyn Sargent. I'm the relatively new executive director of the Himes Foundation in Boston, which is a very um, unique organization. I've been in philanthropy for over two decades, but Himes Foundation, um, two years ago, it's about close to 100 years old, but two years ago, decided to focus ex uh, expressly on racial justice and systems change. And it happily did it before the election. So that's, we sort of got a little bit ahead. But one of the things in sort of answering your question, Steve, about like how, how should philanthropy act at this moment, because it ties back into what Hyams is, and probably many of you don't know Hyams Foundation. Is that correct? <laughs> and that's part of the problem. So that's what we're kind of working with, and I'll tell you a little bit why. I actually, I did actually have the pleasure of working with Brian very briefly <laughs> years ago Brian, when I was at Open Society <laughs> Foundation. Um, and Brian was on uh, this uh, advisory board for something called the Southern Initiative, which was a program that I ran. And he really pushed us to think about um, criminal justice and the way it impacted southern states, which are 11, 11 formerly Confederate in Kentucky is what we were looking at. And so he has always been there. Um, I mean, he stepped out to be absolutely more vocal, but he's always been there pushing um, the issue of, of social justice, racial justice, you know, especially has, as it pertains to um, this further enslavement through incarceration, effectively. And so that has been something that he has really kind of put in the limelight for all of his time working um, at Equal Justice. And so um, what I think philanthropy can do, philanthropy can do is to really be in the front line, to really stand up for issues. A lot of times we focus just on grants. We do about five to six million dollars in grant making a year. We really are a small private foundation. Um, but what we're trying to do now, and this brings it up, and what philanthropy is, is, could be doing right now, is really getting out there and putting ourselves out there and taking a position. And not sort of, there's a way in which I think sometimes in philanthropy we hide behind our grantees and say, you go out there and you take the risk and we'll just be here and we'll give you a grant. But we actually have to go out there and be uh, the representatives for the issues that we care about and for racial justice, what we're trying to do, and we partnered with Monique and, with Monique, Monique and um, Steve and Sherry Brady, who's over here, um, to have Aspen Institute do the, um, the um, collective impact as well as the opportunity youth forums in Boston. And what we're trying to do is really get into the place where people recognize that these important issues are connected and they're critical at this moment in time. So we're trying to really be out front and leverage our reputation as well as our dollars in many ways. Um, so that's just a little bit about kind of the comment and a question that I have is how do we make the connections uh, better with the national, state, and local work? So I wanna really kind of push to understand how we integrate and connect that work. Okay, thank you for the question. Do you, anyone wanna do a quick, I have a quick answer, but I'm not supposed to answer, I'm the moderator. So uh, do you guys have any quick responses? I, I'll just say quickly that with the Opportunity Incentive Fund, we, by design, are really, we do have a focus, particularly on the local and national perspective. So with our, our national network, we convene them, as you just shared, twice a year. And one of our sort of core, core focuses on learning and how we think about system change and advocacy is to be able to really organize and, and, and um, put together what are those local changes, policy changes, system changes that are really critical. That also informs how we think about a national policy agenda as well, and the way that we are able to really integrate those approaches to ideally be able to put together an advocacy agenda that really does reflect a holistic approach to local av advocacy in addition to national advocacy as well. And we try to design it that way so that we could really tie and connect those two things in a meaningful way. Anyway, I'll just point out and we'll go to the next comment slash 
possible question from Alvin, but Sherry Brady in the back, who already got called out, leads Woo. some work at Aspen that is about more effective national funder, local funder partnerships. Uh, we partner a lot with the neighborhood funders group on that work. And our kind of point of view is that most of the time, uh, national philanthropy fails <laughs> at doing effective place-based work. So how do we engage like the leader of Arizona Community Foundation, Steve, in that conversation so that the, the place-based funders who know the context, know the culture, can help the national funders get it right when they land. Uh, and just to Monique's point, we, we wouldn't fund the Hopi tribe with the Opportunity Youth Fund that Monique leads if Steve hadn't said to us, you fund the Hopi tribe or you can't come back to Arizona. And I live in Seattle. You got to go to Arizona in the wintertime when it's raining. So, so it's an example of that translation from local to national. Um, Alvin, you're going to say something. And you are a great example of a national foundation to that question about the local national. You work for the Kellogg Foundation. They said the same thing Monique said. We can't solve intergenerational problems on a grant cycle. We need people in these communities. So you work for Kellogg, but in New Mexico. You've got colleagues in Mississippi, in um, New Orleans, in places where there's deep, long-term structural poverty. So it's a, probably a good segue to ask you to just say something if you'd like, and also a question if you have one. If not, we'll go to Q&A with the others. Thank you, Alvin. Sure, great, great segue. Um, and you know, not, not to show up anybody, but I've been texting Brian Stevenson. <laughs> I'm, I'm lying. I'm, I'm completely lying. Anybody who's out there, I, I don't mean. I, the closest I ever got to him was at a session in Boston. I heard him talk. Okay, <laughs> he's lying. Um, so, so very. Thank you very much for for this excellent panel and discussion for posing the question. So, um, I want to just represent a few things. Um, that, that I think are really prominent for me, one of the reasons why I, I am working at the W.K. Kellogg Foundation. So racial equity is a central part of our work. Um, and I look at Jocelyn because she was there when I first started. Um, and she'll go like this if I'm like completely wrong. <laughs> um, and you know, there's a lot of ways that it's expressed and I don't want to take a whole lot of time, but the, I want to come around to two specific points that I think are critical to make. But I want to first just mention the bullet points of our Truth, Racial Healing and Transformation Initiative or Enterprise. And they're really just more thematic points that, that really characterize not just that work, but what we've learned about racial equity and, and how it should guide all of our, our efforts. So the areas of focus for that are narrative change, racial healing and relationship building, separation, which I should say not only is recognizing the, the, the legacy of segregation, but also the legacy of colonization. So thank you for your mention of the people who are still here. Mm -hmm. um, uh, the law and economy. So those are the, the kind of bullet points. Happy to talk a little bit more about that if, if anybody would be interested. But here's the two points that I think are really critical. And one, you kind of gave me the segue, Steve, is I think if, if we're thinking about the conversation yesterday about um, big philanthropy and the danger it potentially poses to democracy and the power that we wield, I think we have to think really critically about um, how are we actually compelling ourselves to change? Um, and to what extent are we actually reflecting the change we want to see, not just in, in the world as a whole and communities, but in the other anchor institutions and partners we have. So for example, the Kellogg Foundation very intentionally is hiring qualified people of color. And all of us know why I said the word qualified, right? Because there's a place that people go with that right away. These are people who are at the top of their fields, the top of their professions, and there's intentionality around bringing them into the leadership of the foundation. I think that is not only something we're doing because we, we don't want to just tell our grantees that they should do that, but because we, we are doing it. So that means also some of, our, some of our longstanding partners, and I'll say this in New Mexico, who don't represent that in their leadership. It means us actually engaging them saying, how can we actually support you in, in putting together a diversity plan, diversifying your boards, diversifying your senior leadership. That I think is, is critical. Um, so those are the two points I want to make, which is how do we change ourselves and also how do we become a force to help propel that change in, in our core partners? Thank you, Alvin. Uh, we had questions over here. Is that Sharon? Yeah, that's Sharon. Hi. Um, we'll start with you. Thank you so much. Hi, I'm Sharon Alpert. I'm the president of the Nathan Cummings Foundation in New York. And um, first, I want to just thank the rock star panel up here. Sorry that Ken couldn't be with, with us today, but how rare it is to have three women up on the panel, so thank you. Um, 
You, shout out for the token white guy, too. Yeah, I mean, that's yeah. always... You just organize the things. <laughs> um, so I want to pick up on two themes. One, the, the love for Brian Stevenson and how it inspired us um, at the foundation, and also this theme of how we change ourselves and talk about our boards. And so um, four days after the election this year, obviously planned for before the election, we spent an entire day with our board talking about criminal justice. And not just talking about it, but getting proximate to it. So we were inspired by Brian's words here last year about getting proximate. And we believed that in this moment in time, what philanthropy really needs to do is change not only what we work on, but how we work. And so we spent a day organized with our partners and we went to arraignment court. And we lived the experience of what it is to see firsthand people shuttled through a system with scant opportunity to speak for themselves, a minute with a judge or a lawyer, and being shuttled through on issues that any one of us deal with every day, but we deal with them in privacy, with um, social workers, with therapists, with family health care givers. And we saw people being put in jail for health issues, for family disputes, um, and that these are gonna impact the rest of their lives. By the end of the day, the questions that our board was asking were completely different. We also spent time with our own interns who've come through the criminal justice system on a panel with CEOs and other people who've participated in um, programs that give a second chance to people. And so we kind of leveled the playing field too and really brought, as you were all talking about, allowed people to speak for themselves on these issues. So we went from a very, you know, uh, top level perspective at the beginning to, of the day with uh, the head of the John Jay Criminal Justice College. And at the end of the day, we were you know, talking on a very uh, critical level with those, with people who've been through the system. And in the middle of the day, we were in, sitting in arraignment court, right? Not able to talk, listening, um, seeing how fast things move, and also recognizing that this wasn't created for us. It wasn't, an, you know, moving through a, a structured day, right, where we were for example, you know, going to visit a jail, which is also a very impactful experience, but this wasn't constructed for us, right? We were part of a public system of which we all have an opportunity to participate. So if right. anyone wants to hear more about how we did that with our board and the effect it's had even now and how I think it really set us up for moving more boldly and speaking out, as Jocelyn was just talking about, standing up for our values when we see them under attack. Okay, well, that was, thank you, and I think people should check in with you. If you want to talk to folks who are getting proximate and doing work with uh, folks who are returning citizens, you got to meet Marcus here, who won the, won the prize for entrepreneurship last year at Aspen and is doing incredible work. So I just call folks who want to understand that to talk to him afterwards. We are at time, but I'm going to use the prerogative of five more minutes that I don't actually have the authority to use uh, as moderator. And just, so let's do... Three questions, and then you guys are going to close by picking one to answer, and they just have to be questions. So if it's a comment, I'd ask you to uh, either figure out how to very quickly turn it into a <laughs> two sentence or less with a question mark on the end of it, or let's talk <laughs> after. So who has a question? All right, so we're going to go boom, boom, boom. These three questions, and then you, will, our esteemed panelists will answer and respond. And I ask you to try to keep it to two sentences or less with a question mark. Thank you. Okay, uh, so the question is uh, related to the work that we do on the ground uh, in youth, uh, in our organization, and the challenge we're having, you mentioned system disruptors, uh, is that we also have system destructors, and it's been hard for us to, um, to, to work together uh, towards a common goal. So, uh, and some of us are getting funding from similar foundations, and so some of the work and the goals are different, even though we're both in the same side, I think, of, of the fence. Um, so I guess the question is, how do, how do foundations feel about the destruct, destructor versus disruptor work, uh, and, and how do we manage that uh, in our communities? That's a, maybe it's that's, that's a deep question. one. We'll, we'll try to touch on it. Uh, Steve, do you want to throw? Lisa, we met a while back. Um, question for you. Um, on this issue of whether foundations have misdiagnosed the structural problems. I'd say it's not a misdiagnosis of that, it's a lack of courage and willingness to take real risk. 
Yeah. They know. How far is Prudential willing to go to address publicly with that billion dollars these deep structural problems that have created what we're living with today and that exist today and, and, and are built on laws made very recently that still promote the same notion of economic inequality and racism structurally in society. How far will you guys go? Thanks, Steve. Well, Lutha knows what her closing comment will be now. <laughs> last, qu last question. Please introduce yourself. Hi, I'm Bettina Burge. Is it? Okay. Yeah. I'm Bettina Burge. I was from Birmingham, Alabama, and I'm sure I've passed Brian Stevenson on the interstate. <laughs> um, <laughs> coming from the Birmingham airport, and my husband works in Montgomery. So anyway, um, I'm trying to say this very nicely since mm -hmm. we're on camera, mm -hmm. but I, I'm just a very direct person. So how are people who do not reflect the populations that they're making decisions for, um, doing the work necessary to understand their own biases, uh, biases, um, mm. their isms, mm. and their um, sometimes unwillingness, um, their willingness to point fingers at other people and not to understand that they too are a problem. Thank you. I'm, I'm glad privilege came up in the final, <coughs> final Q&A. Take it away. Panelists, you each have like 30 seconds to respond and close us out on these very easy questions. And just feel free to pick one, feel free to ignore all three, however you want to close us out, because we are at time. Go ahead. Monique, do you want to start? So on your question about the um, people who you have to work with that are part of the, the problem, essentially, uh, for, I would say, our Grand C partners, thinking about the, the, the real long term, like I'm thinking about Boston, I'm thinking about Philadelphia, how they have been able to have relationships with systems over time and how they hold onto that long term perspective so that they can continuously create the table that brings together the leaders who really are actually aware of the structural issues and can work in partnership with them to change it. Because you're absolutely right that those those um, people to distrust are actually part of the problem and can um, oftentimes have access to decision-making authority and power that undermines this work. And so I think when we talk about the collective, inter collective impact, community collabor collaborative approach, that long-term way that they build the table to get to change over time, it doesn't quite solve it, but it is part of how they think about getting to the solutions. And um, Batima, thank you for your question. I will tell you, it is the thing that probably keeps me up at night, personally as a parent, and then certainly professionally in this work that we are doing. And I would say it really honestly looks different in all of the communities. You know, we have some communities that they are, um, not even willing to have a conversation about solutions without talking about race, without talking about inequality and how all of this comes together to continuously disrupt the problem. And then we have other communities where that is a significant part of the work is how do we have these honest conversations and dialogue so it looks different across communities. I'm happy to talk to you offline because we do have um, communities that, like I'm thinking of Southern rural Maine, that is comprised mostly of white leaders that are ruthlessly interrogating their own privilege because they can't even imagine doing this work without being honest about where they need to develop internally. Great, ruthlessly interrogating our own privilege, Darren Walker quote, just to give him a little balance with Brian. Mm -hmm. uh, Monique, you violated the rules, you answered two questions. <laughs> Leticia, one question, we've yeah. gotta go. Um, so just very quickly, and I can only speak from you know, our philanthropic um, institution, um, so we've done a ton of work. Um, my board right now is, you know, all, all the family, and it has been like that since we started. But one of the things that we started to do is think about, well, if we're um, leading with race and we're leading with social justice, what does that then mean about the makeup of our board? And what does it mean um, to investigate, right? Um, issues of privilege, issues of legacy. And what it's done um, is, I think, open up really challenging conversations. But right now, you know, I'm super excited. We've opened up the board to non-family board members um, for this is the first time. So we're in the process of interviewing and finding 
people that will come and be part of the board um, for the first time ever. And that was a process, but I think it was an important process to say, well, wait a minute, we're talking about, you know, we're leading with race and we're talking about social justice, but the only people of color that we that the board used to see was the staff. Um, and so I think it's really important to meet people where they are, but really to push the issue to say, you know, what does, what does nothing for us without us look like at the board level, the same way that we ask our grantees those questions. Great, Latha, yep. one sentence and then you and Steve can huddle in this uh, at post. So we are committed to picking our spots and to going out in a bigger way. We've done it here and there in various venues, um, but we know that there's an opportunity and a need, and so we're on that journey. Uh, just let's honor the wisdom and knowledge of these three incredible. Well done, ladies. Thank you all.